Our greatest asset is our human capital. It's the entrepreneurs, as I referenced the other night, that came up through this valley. John Rockefeller coming up from Richford here and going to Owego Free Academy High School before he moved to Ohio. It's Thomas Watson, who was born in Painted Post and built the greatest company in the world that brought the entire world into the computer age and paved the way for everything we have today. There was a man who carried sandwiches with him to the subways. He gave them to homeless people. And he said, I'm making a difference by doing that. I'm not giving cash. I don't know what they're doing with cash. There was one woman he took a liking to. He didn't know her name. He called her Mama Doe. And on Christmas Eve one year, she had frozen death. She passed away. And he said, I got to do something more. And he started the Doe Foundation. He said, we're going to take people from prison. We're going to take people who have never worked. We're going to take people who are drug addicts. And we are going to provide housing for them. We're going to drug test them. And we're going to make sure they work. One guy said, I'm just so proud of that day that there was a snowstorm in New York City recently. I felt like I was needed. I wasn't just sweeping, sweeping the streets. I was involved with cleanup and trying to get New York going again. They asked another guy what his most important part of the program was for him. He held up his cell phone. They said, well, you're making money now, you have a phone? He said, no, I've moved up to an existing exterminator and someone texted me and I'm on a call. Someone needs me. Can you believe that? Someone needs me and my work. There's dignity in every work. We have to get back to that. There's no limit to what free men, free women, and free markets can accomplish. Welcome to episode 125 of American Real and the final interview of 2019. It's been an amazing year and I sincerely thank you for your support. On this week's show, we bring you George Phillips, educator, historian, and a 2020 candidate for U.S. Congress. George challenged my listening skills as his knowledge of American history and his insight on current events and issues are vast and wide. This is not George's first run at U.S. Congress but he explains why he feels he's the right person for the job and why now may just be his time. In addition to politics, we discuss George's work for the Jack Kemp Foundation, Reclaim New York, and his family's working class roots. Much of this episode feels as if George brings us directly into a history book. And speaking of books, have you thought about writing your own book to express your passion and grow your authority? Join me and Andre Heichel Jr. for an interactive incubator course to birth your own book. Check out the link in the show notes for more details. And now, without further ado, I bring to you Mr. George Phillips. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is George Phillips, educator, and you're currently running for Congress. George, welcome to the show. Roger, thanks for having me on. It's wonderful to have you, and, and there's so much uh, I want to talk to you about today because I heard you give a speech uh, about three weeks ago, and I was really impressed with, number one, um, the care mm -hmm. that you gave in your speech, your preparation, mm -hmm. and much like what we do here, there's a, there's a lot to prepare before mm -hmm. a speech. 
I understand you teach effective speaking mm -hmm. at the college. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, but your delivery and you, uh, the history that you bring in mm -hmm. to, to your talks, I was very impressed. So I'm really happy to sit down with you today. Well, thank you. And as you mentioned, public speaking, I bet many of the viewers cringe and say, I don't want to speak. Oh, I've got a toast coming up at a wedding or I've had to, to do this at work here. I always say try to bring forward what you're passionate about and be sincere. And I think anyone can do a great job in public speaking if you do that. And as you can see, I have a lot of passion. My mentor was Jack Kemp, the famous Buffalo Bill football star who was a politician. When he died at his funeral, they said his passion was passion. So I always like wow. to think about that. I certainly have a lot of passion. Absolutely. <laughs> and you have a lot of energy. You don't even drink coffee. Right. <laughs> so, um, so let's get into it. I, um, I'd love to start with your roots here mm -hmm. in upstate New York. Um, can you take us back? What was it like growing up? Sure. How did you become an educator? Just mm -hmm. give us, if you can, a nice entree into the, your, your history. Sure. As you mentioned, I'm in politics. I like to talk about working class roots here, my own to an extent, and then my family. How did my family get here? I grew up in the area here. I grew up in Endwell. My family's from Hornell, New York. It was an old train town. And my grandpa, my uncles, my mom, my grandma, almost all my relatives worked on the old Erie line. My grandpa dropped out of school when he was 12 years old, worked for years on his own, married when he was later at 30. 30 was late back then. He had nine kids. He was born on his family farm and then became a labor union leader who helped fight to get weekends off. And I love all these years teaching American history. When we get to the Korean War, President Truman seized the railroads during the Korean War when they tried to strike. And my grandpa never forgave President Truman for that. He was one of the leaders who helped fight. They'd gotten Saturdays off, Sundays off. They wanted to get Saturdays off as well. So I think about that. That's so much part of my history, even though my grandpa passed away before I was was born. My dad was working on the railroad. He had a pretty good job. And I could picture the scene. He was running the line from Hornell, which is out, you know, going towards Jamestown, going to Cleveland. He said, you know, I could do this and have a pretty good life for my family here. And he saw an older guy who was in his 50s and he was running that same line for 20 or 30 years. And he said, or I could take the risk and go to college. He ended up going to Alfred University. All he could afford to do was go to the school that was state funded there, the School of Ceramic Engineering. He'd been good in math and science. So he became a ceramic engineer, wound up here at IBM. So I grew up, uh, for those who are watching, especially from Andwell area, Vestal, typical IBM family. It seemed like everyone on our street, dad's worked at IBM. Dad coached me in sports, went to Catholic schools, St. Anthony's, and then Seton. So that was my background. And first political event was 1984, Ronald Reagan at Uwe High School told the story of the American dream. It's I remember that. Certainly I went. Left a deep impression on me. But like a lot of our viewers in high school, even though I loved history and I loved studying, politics is very skeptical about it. I said, this is just too dirty, too cutthroat. I went to Boy State Leadership Conference. There was a lot of guys from downstate, and we're here in upstate. We're nice, more laid back. These guys were cutthroat, even in model government and leadership conference. Yes. I said, this is not for me. Was it at LeMoyne at the time? <clears throat> that summer was actually at Alfred State. Okay. My dad went to Alfred U. It was at Alfred State, so it was out by Hornell, okay. where our family roots were. And I had sworn off politics, went to college, went to Villanova, was studying engineering because that's what my dad had done, but my passion was really in history. I switched to being a history major. I had a scholarship from IBM. And my summers in college, I worked in IBM in manufacturing. What an experience that was. It was the tough days for IBM. So we're talking about mid-90s. The cuts had come. The early retirements had come. We we're down to a lot of temp workers. So I saw the plight of the American worker. What we're really seeing today, so many people in our district, in our country, feel that jobs have been sent overseas. And we see just recently the last circuit boards that were made at the old IBM plant. That has been sold to a company in the Midwest. So a lot of great years there. I feel like I was a part of it in a small way and learned those, those working class roots. It was my first job besides being a paper boy, which I did for a long time. And it's certainly part of my story. I went to Notre Dame for graduate school. I did a special teaching program that took me to Louisiana. So I teach here in the community at Seton Catholic Central and Broome Community College. I served for about five years as Dean of Students at Seton Catholic Central, but I've also taught in Louisiana I taught inner city DC public schools as a long-term sub. 
and I also taught one summer at the McCormick Secure Center. That's a maximum security youth detention facility north of Cander. Many of our young men there, I was teaching summer school, were serving life sentences. Some of them were for violent crimes. They were with us until they turned 21. So amazing experiences as an educator. In between the teaching, I was a congressional aide in Washington for four years for a congressman I'd interned for in college. A professor said to me, he said, look, I know you like history, you're taking some poli-sci courses. Why don't you go to Washington? There's this congressman from New Jersey. His name's Chris Smith. He's still serving. He got elected when he was 27 in 1980. He's in his late 60s now. When I served for him, he was the vice chairman of the International Relations Committee, the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee. I fell into a position, even though I didn't have a foreign affairs background, doing his foreign affairs work. So here I am in the years after the 9-11 attacks, working for the vice chairman of the International Relations Committee. He is the leading voice on human rights in the entire Congress. I traveled around the world to Vietnam, to South Korea, to Africa on human rights missions for him, worked on four bills signed into law. One of them was on human trafficking. He was the author of the original human trafficking bill in 2000. I worked on a 2003 follow-up law for him and what an incredible heartbreaking issue. Women, children, 20,000 being trafficked into this country each year, mostly for the purposes of forced sex and prostitution rings. Every day I thought about my work with these women and children. I had a picture of two Indian girls. They were approximately 10 years old, and I thought about them every day. They'd been rescued by a Christian group from a trafficking ring, but just think about that. In India, they were selling girls as young as 8, 10, 12 years old into trafficking rings. So just an amazing experience with him, very bipartisan. I can't tell you how many times when we needed something, I felt the best advice as working for a Republican congressman would be to call a Democrat staff member, a Democrat attorney. We worked very well on those issues together. It showed me what can be done in Washington. It is sad because there's so much fighting, so much partisanship. And I really am entering this race for Congress, which is not my first run, but I'm, I'm continuing 2010 on. in 16, or, uh, yeah, So I actually ran against Congressman Maurice Hinchy twice. Okay. That was a crazy district under the old lines. It was Ithaca to the Hudson Valley, and there was 43,000 more Democrats. People said, look, there's no way you could beat Hinchy. You're going to have to do it twice. The first time, we certainly were trying to win, but it was a very tough year in 2008. 2010, we were this close. We had Bill Clinton right down the street campaigning against us at the Holiday Inn, and we lost just barely. We're in a new congressional district. Those in the Binghamton area now. It's Binghamton to Utica, a district with 30,000 more Republicans. I was in the primary in 2016, lost a crazy three-way primary. We're back here in 2020, and I think this is going to be our time. But as I was getting ready for my r run for Congress, I'd worked with Jimmy Kemp, the son of Jack Kemp, and I ran into Jack Kemp at a reception. He'd been my college graduation speaker. I love Jack Kemp. I went to see him speak wherever I could, but I never established a personal connection to him. And I said, I said, look, sir, you know how bad things are in upstate New York. We need you. And he had me and he mentored me. He endorsed me in the early Hinchy run. And I just remember almost everything he told me. What an incredible man. What an incredible figure. The biography on him recently said he's our most important political figure in the 20th century who didn't become president, certainly the most important Republican. The Democrats that were listed in that analysis were Ted Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey. That's a very distinguished yes. company. He really helped galvanize what we call the modern conservative movement with supply-side economics. Obviously, we met recently at a party where we had Dr. Art Laffer in, and that was fascinating. We have Art Laffer in Binghamton here. Art Laffer was an economic advisor to President Nixon. Art Laffer sits down with Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld when they're working for President Ford, and he draws the Laffer curve on a napkin saying, look, we can cut taxes and still have growth. He teaches Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp is essentially a student. Jack Kemp buys into supply-side economics. Kemp Roth becomes the Reagan tax cuts. And what a remarkable move in history. But Kemp had such an impression on me. He died 10 years ago now from cancer, but I've worked for his son at the Jack Kemp Foundation on and off for the last eight years, trying to see the world through the eyes of Jack Kemp, the sense that our potential is limitless. My favorite Jack Kemp quote that I probably said at the reception is, there's no limit to what free men, free women, and free markets can accomplish. And I think it is sad here in upstate New York. We're here in an incubator here where 
There's entrepreneurs trying to get going here. We hear the same things here, even when people have tax breaks and tax deals. What's going on in New York here? There's too much crony capitalism. Even if we have the tax breaks, the energy costs are so high. The regulations are so high. And it's very, very sad. I think I mentioned at the dinner party as well, Art Laffer wrote a book called The Wealth of States. And they did a study from 1991 to 2014. The average private sector job growth in the country is 24%. New York with Wall Street was only 10% during that time. Yeah. And that's what we see up here. Great people, great place to, to live and raise a family. I'm so happy to be living here with my wife and our three boys. You could get anywhere you need to in 15 minutes. The uh, lady out front said, did you come from out of town? I said, well, I came from Manuel. Of course, that's only 15 minutes away. Any appointment you need to get to? What a wonderful place here. But the economy, what are we going to do? How are we going to go forward? I was the regional director for two and a half years of a group called Reclaim New York. Our mantra was taxes are high, corruption's a problem, and people are leaving. Almost everyone agreed with that. We we're fighting for reform locally. We we're fighting for reform in Albany. And as I've entered in this next run for Congress, I've said, I really believe that I could take all my experiences, my roots in the community here, being mentored by these two great members of Congress, one who is tremendous on human rights, one who is tremendous on the American dream, the American idea, and make more of a difference for this community in Washington for some bold reforms that I think need to be addressed, then I could continue to fight for reform in Albany. We need to keep fighting for reform there, but that's that's where I'm at right now. That's so that's my, my introduction, a little bit of everything. Wow. Thank yeah. you for that overview. Just incredible. Yes. Very diverse uh, right. experience, which is which is great. But tell us, when when did the thought change that, because mm -hmm. you said early on you had no interest in politics, mm -hmm. Boy State, all that. Mm -hmm. When when did the thought change? Was it with Jack Kemp? Mm -hmm. Was working for Congressman Smith. Okay. Certainly. He is just relentless. Uh, I still remember the first resolution I had that cleared the House chamber. It was on East Timor. And we've heard about East Timor a little bit in the news with the tsunami, Aceh, Indonesia. They were becoming the first new country of the new millennium. And he said, we've got to get a resolution up on the House the same day that they're becoming a new nation. That'll mean so much to people there. I'd called the House leadership. I called our committee staff. And they said, look, you don't have enough co-sponsors. You don't have this. You don't have that. We can't get it up. He comes and stands next to me at my desk. He grabs the phone. He starts rifling through phone calls. And after about five or ten minutes, he has the resolution up. And he says, the first rule in life is never accept no for an answer. And it was that relentless energy that drove me with him, that drove us to human rights missions around the world. And I think it's still a very much an untold story. If I go to Washington, I'm asking people here to send me to Washington to work certainly primarily on the economic domestic issues. We have record low unemployment right now, but look at our community here. Sure, the unemployment numbers might be down, but so many good jobs have left. So how do we rectify that? I think even with this boom recently, we're still just scratching the potential of what we could do as a country. So I'm going primarily to work on the economic issues, which I've learned so well through Jack Kemp, but I want to take that expertise that I had with Mr. Smith of the process of building coalitions, of never saying no, of getting legislation done. And I, I certainly want to keep in mind a human rights agenda, which I call a freedom agenda. Look at the world right now. We have Iran protests going off again. We have Cuba, which I worked a lot on. We have North Korea. We have these other rogue regimes. We need to take a freedom agenda that we had during the Cold War. I wrote a piece about human rights in Cuba. And I said, look, this is the, the storyline we need to take. Think about Lech Walesa in the 1970s. The U.S. government and the U.S. media helped make him. He was time man of the year and he won a Nobel Peace Prize. So we put him on the map and said, look, this is the guy fighting here. And lo and behold, with the help of John Paul II and the Solidarity Movement, uh, this guy is the first crack in the Iron Curtain. And a few years later, the whole thing falls down. We have people like that in Cuba. I believe in Iran, Iran is obviously complicated. The resistance there is not necessarily favorable to the United States, but they'd be better than the terrorist sponsoring regime we have now. And I think there's still hope in North Korea, but we need to follow that model. Uh, very few listeners would know in Cuba, there's a group of brave women. They're called Las Damas de Blanco, the ladies in white. Every Sunday after church, they're protesting the Castro regime. Castro's out now, but it's still essentially the Castro regime. 
They are attacked. They're beaten. Many of their husbands are in prison being tortured. They should be household names. And you look at technology here with cell phones and, and the Internet and, and texting and even what we've seen in, in the Arab Spring here, I think there's hope and I think we could do more with what would essentially be called smart power. Everyone says, is there going to be war with Iran? The Iranian people don't like the regime. The Cuban people many of them don't like the regime. We have huge opportunities here to spread, I think, what would be called the freedom agenda. So I still hold on to that from Mr. Smith. But day in and day out in the campaign trail, I think about health care. I think about welfare to work. I think about the national debt. I think about what more we could do with the U.S. economy. Again, people are saying, wow, 3% unemployment. We could do so much more than that even. It sounds like you have a, a game plan. Yes. And look, I'm obviously a, a, a novice at, at, at politics, but my father was a city councilman, so I somewhat grew mm -hmm. up in it, um, understanding the, the campaign process. I worked for uh, Juanita Crab mm -hmm. as an intern, so I, I had mm -hmm. some exposure into She's that. She's my brother's art teacher. But my, yeah. My, yeah. Me Yours as well, as well yes, yeah. yes. So, uh, but when I, when I hear you speak, and I think about the politicians that are in Congress, and not mm -hmm. to compare, right. but even if you look at our president, um, you have a very solid understanding of our history. Right, and I think absolutely. That's really important. <clears throat> the history helps a lot. And then just a passion for policy. I started to talk about human rights a little bit, but I'd love to, as we have time here, talk about health care, talk about welfare reform. What the challenge is, is campaigns really come down to so much the 30 second sound bites. Not too many voters were able to see me in this type of arena, or the debates are not like the presidential debates. So it's it's really challenging. How do you convey a message in 30 seconds here? One consultant said to me, he said, there's there's three things that we look for. How do we get people to know their name, your name? And people know that around here. I have eight, eight counties, though, so trying to get my name out in the other counties. Something about you. Well, I'm a teacher, but I want to phrase myself as an economic policy expert. That's what I've really done for the Jack Kemp Foundation. And then finally, something that you stand for, an issue that you stand for, a platform. The one issue I've been telling voters around here out of all of the policy items I'm pa passionate about is I want to lower property taxes. And they'll say, well, you're running for federal office. I want to lower property taxes by making it illegal for federal welfare mandates to be passed from Albany to our local taxes. We're the only state in the country that does that. Can you explain that? So. I yes. understand and others. Yes. So Medicaid is an important federal program. It's health insurance for lower income. It's shared in every state between the federal government and the state. New York has a very generous Medicaid program. It is $60 billion a year. We have $33 billion coming from the federal government, $27 billion coming from the state. Okay. That's $60 billion out of a roughly $150, $160 billion budget. We could debate the merits of that. I think most listeners would say, look, we have to have something for those in need. Has Medicaid become too generous? Uh, some complain, I'm a small business owner. My insurance isn't as good as Medicaid, and I'm paying so much for it. Huge frustrations. New York State is the only state in the country that says, okay, to pay for Medicaid, we're not just paying for it from state income taxes. We are sending it to the counties. So if you look at the Broome County budget, in your county tax levy, over 50% is going to Medicaid. Broome County and other officials in counties across the state are frustrated because they say, look, we have to pay so much for this. We have no jurisdiction on how it's run. And there are certainly many people who need the program. There are people who are lower middle class who are saying, I can't afford a 20 or $30,000 health plan and qualify for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at that part of the problem. But fundamentally, I don't think that local taxpayers should be paying for federal programs. In the Obamacare repeal a couple of years ago, there was an amendment that would make it illegal for the states to pass Medicaid to localities. And it came very, very close. So we have a chance at that. And I think as you look at New York State here, as you look at your entrepreneurs in this building here, as you look at businesses that would want to come in, the property tax burden is one of our, yeah. our top issues. So this would not address school taxes, city taxes, town taxes, but your county tax levy to think that over 50% is going to a federal welfare program. People are angry about that. And I think we've got an opportunity there. When I worked with Reclaim New York, we found that the Vestal School District had 20 million in reserve on a $76 million budget. We were saying, can you give some of these back, some of this money back? So there's no easy answer on property taxes, but that's one issue I certainly talk about. If I could parlay into healthcare in general Please. from here, 
huge issue. And I think we're on both sides missing the mark on some real fundamentals. Obamacare came about because they said, look, there's 20 million Americans who can't afford insurance. They're not qualifying for Medicaid. They can't afford private insurance. Here's the solution. In my opinion, too much government coming in. The most inefficient markets right now are education and healthcare because the government is so involved. If you look at our schools, K through 12 in New York State, we've got some great schools. I know you mentioned your daughter at Binghamton and programs she's doing. It's costing $21,000 a year to educate students K through 12 in New York State. The private sector would would always be more efficient. I'm not saying we could just privatize education, but just amazing to think of that cost, $21,000 a person. Let's go to healthcare. The average family plan right now is $20,000 a year. So for those who are listening, if you're getting insurance from your employer, you might say, wow, my premium is only five or six or seven a year. Remember, your employer is putting in 10 or 12 or 14 or 15. That's money you could see in salary. So that's how I want to mm -hmm. phrase the healthcare debate. The $20,000 cost is money you could see in salary. When my wife, we were fortunate to have children, wow, $5,000 hospital bill. That's great that our insurance paid for all of that, but we're still paying 20000 right. that year. So it's a market that I think is very inefficient. When you look at Medicaid and Medicare, for that matter, the reimbursement rates aren't the same. So if I had Medicaid, you had private insurance, we both broke our leg. The Medicaid, the hospital would go to the government with Medicaid and say, what's my reimbursement? And they'd say, okay, it costs you $500 to, to treat this guy. We're giving you 600 For you, they would just say, okay, we're not dealing with the government here. We're going to the private insurer. We're going to charge you 1500 for the same thing. My dad had an aneurysm when he was younger. My doctor suggests they get a, a test on my aorta just to make sure everything was good there. $2,500 just for what would be equivalent of an ultrasound for a woman. So costs are just out of control. We need to talk about cost. We're the only market where you don't see the costs. If you went into a hospital or a doctor's office and you said, how much is it going to cost? They'd look at you like you're crazy, right? So we don't see costs. The costs that are hidden are, are really astronomical. And it came to a head for me when I left my teaching job full time to do Reclaim New York. And Reclaim New York said, look, we're a nonprofit. We're based out of New York City. You're the only one on the family plan. It's $30,000 a year. We're going to pay for a good portion of it. The amount that I was going to pay was still astronomical. So my wife and I do not have health insurance. We're under something called MediShare. We share bills with other people in the partnership. Hmm. I pay $300 a month. I do have a $10,000 deductible, which is hard. We could, through MediShare, have a much smaller deductible. So the deductible is hard. I'm upset that I can't establish a health savings account. I think health savings accounts are key to this. And we need to get a health care system where... The first tier, in my opinion, should be people paying out of pocket to the extent possible, even through health savings accounts. So if your employer puts that in there, hey, here's the health savings account and here's for your direct payments. We need to end a process where it's my son goes to the doctors, a letter goes to the insurance company back and forth, and then two months later we get a bill for $70. That's just extremely inefficient. Pay for the little things out of pocket through health savings accounts. I think we could do a similar thing with Medicaid as well. And then we're cutting out a lot of that traffic for the smaller bills. Insurance then could really focus more on the medium bills, the five or 10,000, maybe up to 250,000. I have cars, my cars are covered and my wife and I are covered on insurance for what, $1,200 a year that would get us $250,000 of coverage in auto insurance. Now that market is, less complicated, but still, nonetheless, it shows where we are with healthcare. And then why don't we look at a government role for those catastrophic cases? If pers a person can't afford platinum insurance and they wind up where they have the childhood cancer case that's costing millions of dollars, perhaps that's the, that's the public option. I think that would allow insurance markets to heal. And what I say is we need a dynamic market of choice. We need more choices in healthcare. If you have a good health insurance plan with government now, with a corporation, you still usually only have plan A or plan B, or maybe plan A, B, or C from one company to choose from. We could choose anywhere from car insurance. We could choose anywhere for life insurance. That's a dynamic market of choice that brings rates down, brings quality up as well. So I love health care. I'd like to serve on a committee that handles health care. I do think Republicans for hammering away 
against Obamacare for years didn't come up with a good plan for the American people where they said, look, this is this is something where every American's going to do, be- do better. And again, I'll come back to what we started off with, 20 million Americans who didn't have insurance. But what about all the ones who do, who are paying $20,000 a year and losing all that in salary? I'd love to say to federal employees, because with Congress, we control the federal employee plan. Hey, you're under a great health insurance plan now. The taxpayers are paying a lot for it, by the way. And how would you like to make more money and have a more diverse plan? We'll give you five or 10,000 extra in, in insurance if you try a plan like, like I have, like MediShare or something. I bet a lot of people would take, yes. take us up on that. We could cut taxes, but the best way to give Americans a five or $10,000 raise is to fix healthcare if yeah. we could do that. So a couple of questions off of that. Number one, do you feel as we sit here right mm-hmm. now that healthcare can be corrected? Or do you see it continuing mm-hmm. to spiral as it has for the last mm-hmm. how, however many years? Do you think there, there is a solution out there? I think it can be. It's hard because the progressive liberal side is going towards socialism, saying we want single payer. I've run into people in this community here who say, I've gone to Canada. Sorry, I've gone to Buffalo for cancer treatment. And I see so many Canadians coming in who are waiting in line in Canada and that model's not working. So I strongly disagree with going towards socialized medicine. I think we need more choices, but I still think on, on the Republican side, we haven't come up with, with more solutions. What I've thrown out here, we could do pilot programs for federal employees. We could do things with Medicaid, Absolutely. perhaps. We could offer pilots where we're saying, hey, here's ways to show how the market works. Mm-hmm. Without having to adopt a huge right. bill. To, yeah, right. yeah, it was hard yeah. when you do the huge sure. bill. I mean, look at how hard they fought on Obamacare and they mm-hmm. had to, to ram it through. So if we could show things that work on smaller ways, I think we can, I think we could do it. But overall, you know, we have to just keep coming back to, to costs. The Trump administration's come out now with requirements saying you have to start posting bills. So I think that's a huge step. We need to start looking at bills more and saying this is what it's what it's costing yeah. us, right? You know, they'd say the same thing, health insurance and uh, and taxes, it's taken out of your check automatically, right? If you had to write the check every month for your taxes or health insurance, you would <laughs> you'd feel it more. So we need to start talking yeah. about this more. And George, just a curiosity question, because I, I just can't, I, I, I'm pretty much in the middle of the road mm-hmm. on, on politics in general. Right. Why is there so much extreme mm-hmm. in, in thought? Right. Is it because of party line? Right. You know, or, or is it, do people really believe in, you know, a very liberal view or a very conservative view, and that's just the way it is? Or why is, there, why is this happening? Yeah, I think some too do. If you look back in history, there's always tough fights in politics. When you had the 90s and you had President Clinton and some of the issues with him and the rise of 24-hour media, 24-hour media is playing off of ratings. Mm. So unless they're doing something controversial, they're not getting ratings. And the unfortunately, the negative and the scandal tends to sell, sell more. We're losing, I think, the debate on issues, the things I like to talk about here and and getting into things. If you look at the rise of Trump and even Sanders to that extent, it shows how upset people are on the right and left, that people are so upset with the establishment. So I think that's given us an opportunity, but we need to have better discussions on the issues. And if you look at the the Trump voter, Trump voters are saying, hey, I think Washington's a mess. I think people have forgotten about us there. My jobs have been sent overseas. I don't know that he's laid out the clearest solutions for everything on it, but he certainly tapped into some some chords. So how do we talk to people who feel left behind here? How do we talk to middle of the road voters? I do think it is on an honest policy debate. And I come back to Jack Kemp. He did an amazing job of trying to work with Democrats. Bill Bradley was a co-sponsor of the 86 tax reform, the famous Princeton, uh, New York Nick basketball player and U.S. Senator from New Jersey, would you believe we got tax rates down to 28%, the highest rate? We only had two rates. I believe the second rate was 15% in the 86 tax reform. So we said, wow, this would be good for the country. And we were able to come together and knock out a lot of the special interests and the deductions and make it just a really clean tax bill. Is that still within us here? This, things are so partisan. Now, we had 97 U.S. Senators right. vote for that. Joe Biden voted for that. And Ted Kennedy voted for that. Are we beyond that today? I still like to have hope here that we can, we can do something. But it seems like we're at a breaking point yeah. at this point. So um, 
Why are you running? I'm running because I want to fight for a bold reform plan for America, a freedom agenda to help lift up the nation. And I think the things that we do nationally, and I'm confident the things we do nationally for America will help this area here. You may say we're always at a disadvantage because we're New York State. We have the highest tax rates in New York State here. But if we reform health care, if we reform welfare, which is another issue I'd like to talk about, critical for this area, if we could do some things for the national debt, if we could continue to look at reforming the tax code, these are things that will help this area as well. Let's segue into welfare. Yes. What are your thoughts, mm -hmm. um, ideas for solutions, mm -hmm. and um, why does this area seem to be in, in a difficult spot when, mm -hmm. it comes to, when it comes to welfare? This is an issue that I take very personally and it makes me very, very sad. If you look at this area growing up in the 80s and 90s, as I did here, you had IBM families, you went to, to parks, to festivals. It was very much, not there weren't different classes, but middle class IBM families. We now have in this area so many families who have come to this area with welfare benefits thinking, oh, our benefits could go farther here. And, and that's sad. It's, because of it, cost it's, of living? Correct, or? cost of living. I think it's to no fault of their own. They're just looking, look, here I am. I've become dependent on a system here. And fundamentally what I'd say with welfare is there's dignity in work. When parents aren't working, I know this from being in inner city schools and, and the maximum security youth prison, that's modeling certain behavior for young people. There's dignity in work and we have to get back to that. We need a bold welfare reform plan that says if you're getting benefits, you have to work, you have to do something. For the Kemp Foundation, I studied all sorts of models and my favorite was the, the Doe Foundation in New York City. There was a man who carried sandwiches with him to the subways. He gave them to homeless people. And he said, I'm making a difference by doing that. I'm not giving cash. I don't know what they're doing with cash. There was one woman he took a liking to. He didn't know her name. He called her Mama Doe. And on Christmas Eve one year, she had frozen death. She'd passed away. And he said, I got to do something more. And he started the Doe Foundation. He said, we're going to take people from prison. We're going to take people who have never worked. We're going to take people who are drug addicts. And we are going to provide housing for them. We're going to drug test them. And we're going to make sure they work. Their first job is sweeping the streets. We're going to pay them a minimum wage for street, sweeping the streets of New York every day. And as they graduate from that, they are going to do other jobs and get trades and skills. If you look at people in that program, the stories are just amazing. One guy said, I'm just so proud of that day that there was a snowstorm in New York City recently. I felt like I was needed. I wasn't just sweeping, sweeping the streets. I was involved with cleanup and trying to get New York going again. They asked another guy what his most important part of the program was for him. He held up his cell phone. They said, well, you're making money now, you have a phone? He said, no, I've moved up to an assistant exterminator and someone texted me, I'm on a call, someone needs me. Can you believe that? Someone needs me and my work. There's dignity in every work, we have to get back to that. If you fail your drug test, you're not kicked out of the program, you just can't work. So work is held up as the ideal now here. We have to get to a system where we can't have any American sitting back and saying, look, if I work, I'm gonna do worse than I would be getting benefits. And benefits are calculated at thirty to forty thousand dollars a year. We have to get away from a system where someone who is is getting benefits is going to Medicaid, food stamps, housing voucher, five or six or seven different agencies. And I think the plan we need to to move towards was laid out by former Speaker Paul Ryan, but it would essentially be: look, we have one counselor for each recipient getting benefits. The person has to do some work. The person has to have a plan for what they're going to do with their life. And we have to make sure that they're getting more working than they would off benefits. We could do that through rescoring the benefits or the earned income credit as well. The earned income credit is a great anti-poverty tool. Right now it's scored more towards families. So up to $70,000 a year, if you have children on your taxes, you're, you're claiming your children for exemptions and, and credits, but there's also an earned income credit okay. that's designed primarily for families. Single individuals are not getting it. The earned income credit is very small. So I think we have to look at the earned income credit and say, look, let's, let's skip the minimum wage debate. In my opinion, it's bad for business. It's, it's cutting jobs. It's hurting workers, actually. And if you're getting a minimum wage job and you're saying, I'm out there all the time and I can't make ends meet, 
hopefully there's a scale where the earned income credit comes in. And we could get off this system where over 50 years after Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty, we're still at a 15% poverty rate in the United States of America. Now, those living in poverty today could say, look, I have insurance, I have housing, I have access to, to food stamps and other programs here. So the level of destitution in poverty is not what it was when Johnson started his war on poverty. But it's very sad that over 50 years later, we're still at a 15% poverty rate, and we still have so many families that are dependent. We need drug testing for those with with getting welfare benefits for that accountability. Look at employers in this area, Raymond Corporation. I have many friends working up there. Out of every 100 employers they hire, they're saying in manufacturing they may only be able to retain 30 to 40. People are failing drug tests. People are saying, oh, this is just too much. It's too hard to work. I could do better off benefits. It's all part of a system that really needs to be fixed. And, you know, again, I think we could get those on the left to say, hey, we want to help people in poverty. We're going to rescore the earned income credit. And we've got to get the right to say, hey, we, we needed to look at the earned income credit. We want welfare to work here. These are things hopefully we could come together on. Thanks for that. That's, yes. That's really good. Um, why is the 22nd District of New York so important? It's important nationally because there's 435 House seats. The control of the House is going to come down to 20 or 30 contested races. And this is arguably the number one race in the entire country. This is a district that Trump won by 16 points that a freshman Democrat is sitting in. There's no district in the entire country that went for Trump by a larger margin that a Democrat is sitting in right now. And again, listeners are going to hear this say, oh, Trump, this and, and that. Uh, this is, as you get north of Binghamton, Rust Belt, jobs have gone overseas. He's performing extremely well in that area. So if you look at the last race, 2018, it was Tenney and Brindisi. $25 million was spent. $16 million was from outside groups. If you look at the $9 million that was spent by the candidates, a lot of that was national money that was poured in to the two campaigns. And national donors, national parties look at the control of the House of Representatives on the line in this district. We'll be in a similar situation again this year, and we're ready for anything. I have to look at, with all this craziness, people say I don't like the negative campaign ads. <laughs> Remember the numbers I just gave you. Out of the $25 million spent, and I don't know it'll be that much this time, but $16 million is outside groups, so the super PACs and the parties. Out of that other $9 million, okay, let's say less than half of that is, is mine. If we're the nominee, sure, money will, will come in. How do I control the couple million dollars, which sounds like a lot, out of that's, that's still only going to be, you know, luckily 20% of what's spent overall. How do we control our message? We want to have a positive message. We want to lay out some of these ideas. We want to talk about our working class roots. We want to talk about solutions here on health care, telling family story. I don't have health insurance. I think it's a great story to tell. I had two family members die with just very difficult illnesses, like many have, but I want to tell those stories. If we're hit on health care saying, oh, you're trying to cut people with pre-existing conditions, and that's our challenge. That's what our challenge is going to be as this campaign continues. Right now we're in a primary, so the primary is different. It's at the end of June. There's a very a relatively small number of voters who vote in the primary. We think about 25,000 people, Republicans, will vote in this primary. It's graduation season. It's so many other things going on. So it's hard to get people to focus in a summer primary. Right now we're trying to connect with them, but our message hopefully that works with them will be working with the general election as well. So you feel the effort put into the primary will parlay into, into the general? Yeah, I think a challenge running in a presidential year, and I've done this before in previous races against Hinchy, one time where we were in a presidential year, another time where we're not. When we get to Labor Day, even though a lot of money will pour into this race nationally, hopefully for me and for Congressman Brindisi, people are going to be focusing on the presidential. presidential. They're going to be saying, what's Trump doing? What's his opponent doing? One of the presidential debates. All the focus is going to be on that. So it's easy, even with all that money, for us to get lost in the shuffle. The primary is going to give us an opportunity to get our name out there, to get our yard signs up, to hopefully get a win on primary night and have that momentum. So the primary, I think, is a big, a big benefit for us, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the challenge. What's different about you today than the last time you ran? Sure, I certainly learned from mistakes. I won't, I won't tell all of them here, but running for office is just fascinating. Raising money is hard. 
uh, the grassroots, the ground game is something we've always specialized at where we're going to be refining that. I had had the Jack Kemp Foundation experience when I ran the last time. I had not had the Reclaim New York experience okay. the last time. But Reclaim New York has certainly made me even more emboldened towards this idea that we are a great nation. We have to look for bold reforms nationally, and that's the best way to, to certainly help New York State. But dynamics are different this time. We had a, a guy from Casanova, Steve Wells, a businessman, put a million dollars into the primary. He's not running this time, so that's helpful for us. But I continue, I think, to grow every day. It's, it's amazing, and I'd say this to all the listeners, I um, – have trouble finding time with three kids and a soccer schedule and running the campaign to, to sit down and read books, actually. But I listen to books on tape all the time, and I love listening to books on tape. Actually, my, my favorite topic is marriage and the family right now, but I listen to a lot of policy books, a lot of history. Every day, Jack Kemp told me, he said, the way you're going to get this is to read the Wall Street Journal, the editorial section. The ideas are laid out there. So many of the things I've, I've talked to you about, yeah, I've come up with some of these ideas on my own, but it's it's reading Steve Forbes. It's reading Art Laffer. It's looking at Steve Moore. It's looking at Larry Kudlow. It's looking at the Wall Street Journal piece. And, and they have they have some liberal progressive thinkers in there. And you've got to look at that and say, why, why did this guy write this piece today about Warren's plan on health care? Why do I disagree with that? I joked at the party the other night. I wanted to watch the Democrat debate. I love watching it. I love to just go back and forth on the issues. My wife didn't want to watch it, but <laughs> we didn't end up watching it. I love the issue debates. And uh, I think that's what's kept me sharp. I've learned so much more since college than I even did in college. Think about in college, you're just reading all the time. And I think this is true for every American. If we keep reading, if we keep learning in our fields, things are limitless. Jack Kemp, when he spoke at my graduation, he said, what a country. I went to Occidental College, which, by the way, Barack Obama went to as well, okay. and then transferred to Columbia. He said, I was a PE major. And here I am, I became the, the uh, candidate for president of the United States, and I became the vice presidential nominee. He was a physical education major and a football player, but he read, he studied, he learned. And that's what I would say to anyone in their field, that just stay stay on the edge. I had a teacher evaluation the other day at my school, and I was really impressed by my vice principal, who's 10 years younger than me, what he came up with. And he's been going to college for another degree. And I said, wow, he's right. He's he's right on these points here. We got to stay, we got to stay sharp on our fields. Yeah. That's for sure. And I think a lot of members of Congress don't. You know, you'd mention what's down there now. So many get there. It's a big title. And staff are doing things. There's lobbyists. There's interest groups. They get up in the daily grind. I've got to raise money. It's it's a real challenge. I'm going down to try to lead on policy issues from day one. We're going to talk to the Laffer team, to these other economists, and say, what can we do that will be bold ideas, that will be a freedom agenda, that we could build a consensus on. So I'd say to the voters, you're not just sending someone down there a vote. Oh, there's going to be a lot. He's voting for Pelosi. He's voting against Pelosi. It's a lot more than that. We need people leading with bold ideas. And I would say Republicans haven't enough as well. So that's one of the reasons I want to go down there. Right. How important is it not to burn bridges, mm -hmm. to continue to network and, and build your relationships mm -hmm. when it comes to politics? You know, it's very interesting as partisan as these times are and we hear people, I hate Trump, I love Trump, I hate this person, I, I love that person. Remind, remember, we're all human beings. We all have flaws here. And it's hard in this campaign here and in the past, oh, this person's endorsing so-and-so, this one's not with me. You got to be tough. You got to keep going. And I had some real good advice from a car dealer up in Norwich. He said, you know what, don't worry about the other dealerships. I always just worried about my dealership doing the best job I could with what I could so I have to look at it that way, but just always look to mend fences. I think I've I've done well with that. I've I've maintained good relations with local Democrats here and Republicans. I'm hoping that Mr. Brandizzi will be my opponent. Nothing personal. I don't know him. I haven't met him yet. I will at some point, but he has a young family as well. So I wish wish him the best. If we win on election night, it's gonna to be tough for him. What are him and his family gonna do? If we don't make it, it's gonna to be tough for our family. So we're all human beings, and I think we forget that in politics, and we're all Americans as well. I'm teaching the Civil War right now. We had six to 700,000 Americans die during the Civil War. Think about the Great Depression. Think about the Vietnam era, which I didn't live through, but I've, I've studied. It's just amazing what we've been through before. So you might say, wow, things are very rough right now, but we've been through a lot. We're Americans, we're gonna persevere, and I think we have to, to look to the better 
better angels of our nature, as Abraham Lincoln would say. Yes. George, can you take us through a typical day for you? What are you doing? You're working. Yeah. You have a family. Right. You're running for Congress. What's a typical day look like for you? Yeah, I wake up. I go to daily mass at St. James. Uh, we have an African priest there, Father Charles. He's my spiritual advisor. So get mass in, get the spirituality in. I'm listening to books on tape. Come home, helping the kids a little bit. I'm out the door with my son, George. Teach four classes at Seton. And then back home to my home office, essentially George's bedroom. Fundraising calls. You know, connecting with voters, looking at ways I could build our grassroots campaign, trying to go out and meet with people as much as possible. The fundraising is important, but would you rather meet someone directly? So trying to look to opportunities to to meet voters directly and talk with them, going to events a lot at night and just making sure we get the family time. I my to to the first and second grader come home at three fifteen. My wife likes to joke, they're little tornadoes. They're good in school all day, right? But they come home and they're cranky and they're they're ready to just get some energy out. We've set up a new playroom in the basement for them where it's just a lot of good boy area where they're kicking balls and have their their toys and their soldiers set up there. So trying to get that family time in too, but just trying to really maximize time. I think that's the challenge with everyone in their work schedule. How am I efficient at work here? How am I efficient with the home life as well? The fundraising is really hard. It's the worst part. Of things. I mentioned I graduated from Notre Dame. We we're fortunate to be down in Texas raising some money with some Notre Dame grads, uh, going to Naples, Florida, going to Chicago. And it, it's just hard here. The amount of money you have to raise, several hundred thousand dollars, is very hard for Congress. It's a huge complaint you hear from people. The, the numbers I gave earlier, why is there so much money in Congress? Again, I'm an idealist. And I'd like to think, look, for myself, for my decision in voting, I don't have to be duped or confused by ads. The ads could could give me an impression here, or the mailers. There's so much available now. I could go to websites. I could learn about candidates. I could watch this show. Hopefully people watch this show and see some things about George Phillips here. But those are the ways that I think, again, as we're looking for structural reform, camp campaign finance, the Supreme Court's declared certain decisions on Citizens United, outside groups are unlimited. We got to look to getting back to the basics. It's still within your control to study the candidates, to research them, to not worry about all these ads. And I think that's the challenge there. It's hard in eight counties to really meet as many people as you'd like to. Yeah. George, do you have a mission statement? Mission statement, my, my mantra is certainly what I said from Jack Kemp before. There's no limit to what free men, free women, and free markets can accomplish. Overall, I'm the relentless happy warrior. And it's certainly that the potentials for Americans are, are unlimitless. We're here in an incubator here, and I would say our greatest asset as Americans is not our government. I'm someone who's for limited government. I think the government is doing too much. But our greatest asset is our human capital. It's the entrepreneurs, as I referenced the other night, that came up through this valley. John Rockefeller coming up from Richford here and going to Owego Free Academy High School before he moved to Ohio. It's Thomas Watson, who was born in Painted Post and built the greatest company in the world that brought the entire world into the computer age and paved the way for everything we have today. Our greatest asset is our human capital. I think we need to try to lift up that entrepreneurial spirit here in upstate New York and in our country, and that's what I intend to do. I'm running for Congress to fight for a bold plan for America, to lift up the people of upstate New York and America. What are your greatest strengths? Mm -hmm. And what are some of your weaknesses? Mm -hmm. Just so I know who George is. Strengths are relentless energy. I told the story about Congressman Smith. He said, never accept no for an answer. I, I like to take as credit a Senate foreign policy staffer who I'd called. I had bothered about moving a bill one time. I was just relentless with. He saw me out at a, a happy hour at a restaurant one night. And he said, you are just such a tribute to your boss. I've never seen anyone like you. You're just absolutely relentless. You don't give up. You just keep going. I think we need a representative like that in Washington. And I'm the same way in every aspect of my life. So that relentless energy, that relentless drive, people say, oh, you're too nice. You're too this. We're not going to give up. And we just keep going. And that's a testimony to doing this campaign. It's it's interesting. Some say, oh, George, you're, you're washed up. You've run and lost. It's interesting every race the Hinchy race, we were a real huge underdog. There's 43,000 more Democrats. No one thought this could be won. So the fact that we did so well there, we certainly take that as a badge of, 
of courage. And our supporters, and had they done some things differently, we certainly could have won. The fact that we continue to keep going, I think, is a testimony to us. The fact that I like to look to Lincoln. Lincoln lost seven elections before he made it to the presidency is a testimony to us. In terms of my weakness, I, I have to lay it out here in the camera here. I have so much energy. And some might say I'm like a tornado. We did this this first segment here, and I was talking about my family and my grandpa on a train, and then this and that, and then we're into healthcare. So trying to stay focused, and we have to figure out, you know, again, in that 30-second sound bite, what can I say to the voters? I can't lay out my whole health care plan. I can't lay out the whole welfare reform plan. I have a huge plan on the national debt as well. So that's the challenge to try to focus all this energy in one area. But our strengths are our vices are our virtues and our virtues are our vices as well. If we can, I'd like to just get a little personal um, because I know it, it's not easy mm -hmm. for a marriage for someone to go through a campaign. Right. And, and now multiple campaigns. Sure. How's your wife doing? And, and how's how does that uh, play into your decisions and, and it's, I, I had the opportunity to meet your wife. It seems like you have a, a, a wonderful bond. Right. But, you know, that's something that's not often talked about. So my wife is from Columbia, South America. We met when I was in Washington. We met at a church. I was at St. Patrick's Church for something for young adults. I was praying to meet a good Irish girl. Uh, I was at an Irish church, and I met a girl from Columbia, South America. So we have a wonderful marriage. She's very much, in some ways, living the American experience, the American dream. You have an interesting perspective as an immigrant in here, but she's extremely loyal and extremely supportive. So I'm thankful for that. When we're talking about getting married, I said I might might be going for office someday. What do you think? And she was very supportive. She's been very supportive all the way. And it's funny, she has, and we have the stresses, I think that all moms and dads have, she seems more stressed out oftentimes about things with the kids. What's going on? Why did he get a bad grade on this? What, what you know, his he needs a new pair of shoes or how could we do practice when he has a test the next day. With the campaign, when I'm stressed out, she's a real rock and strength for me and says, look, it's in God's hands. Just keep going. Just keep doing your best every day. I know she's going to be supportive no matter what. And the previous campaigns, I felt like in so many ways we became closer through that. And you have to remember that, that losing isn't the end of the world as well. I think people heading into, especially this presidential, think if their candidate doesn't win, it's, it's life is over. Uh, one of my favorite speeches in history is actually from a, a very horrible time in history. It was uh, Nixon leaving office at Watergate. And I, you know, looking at it, I think Nixon made some horrible decisions, did some things that did tremendous damage to the country. Some would say we have Trump today because of Nixon, because it started this this huge distrust for government. But like everyone, he had he had some good qualities. And in his last speech there, he's talking to his White House staff and he's reading from Theodore Roosevelt, one of my heroes in history. And he said, I, I was my last night in the White House, I was reading from Roosevelt. He's looking at his diary from his first wife died. His wife died after childbirth. His mother died on the same day. And he writes, she was beautiful in form and lovely, lovelier too in spirit. When the day seemed so bright before us, my heart's dearest died and the light from my life was gone forever. That was Roosevelt. He thought the light from his life was gone forever when he was in his mid-20s. He went off to the badlands of South Dakota he became a cowboy. He met the Rough Riders. He came back. He lost for mayor of New York. He had many other setbacks, but he just kept going, and he was always vital. He was always in the arena. So, look, we're hoping to win this race. I'm hoping to make a difference for my country, but I know I'm making a big difference as a teacher. I know I'm making a big difference for the Kemp Foundation and our other work. So we just keep going, and if you keep that in perspective, I think that's, that's helpful. And, again, for listeners and viewers here, the same thing with your job. If something goes your way or doesn't go your way with your job. There's always going to be one door closes and other opens. When we lost that Hinchy race, boy, that was hard. But to become dean of students in my old high school, that was amazing. To, to, to do work for the Jack Kemp Foundation, that's been amazing. And I've learned so much. I'm much more prepared to, to be a congressman. I'm, more importantly, a better husband and father now after these, these years here. <laughs> Wonderful. Could we just touch on the opioid crisis? Yes. Uh, that's something that is affecting virtually every city in yes. this nation. Um, and, and what makes it tough here mm -hmm. is we know families. Sure, absolutely. Uh, that have had, you know, uh, a loss um, right. of, of their loved ones and continued struggle. Mm -hmm. Heartbreaking. My brother who passed away actually from an eating disorder from some childhood abuse issues was a recovering alcoholic. 
and was a drug abuse counselor at the Broome County Jail. That's why I wanted to go to the McCormick Secure Center. That's why I wanted to work in detention. And we've had alcohol, more alcohol, but also some drug, drug struggles in our family with family members. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. We need counseling. We need intervention on the local level. We need a compassionate approach. I also think we need to take a, plan, a page from Plan Columbia. There is a village mayor here in the village of Lyle. His name is Jerry Mackey. Some might know that name. His, uh, his son was a big, well, if you're at Whitney Point, you know Jerry Mackey. His son is the basketball coach of Oneonta right now. Uh, Jerry's brother, John Mackey, was a colleague of mine in Washington. He was the architect of Plan Columbia. And he said, look, there's supply and demand for cocaine and today now the opioids and heroin. How do we control the supply? We're certainly doing that, I think, with the pharmaceuticals now that so many were getting addicted to. I'm not saying it's not still a problem. What about the heroin that's being grown? What about the fentanyl? What about the methamphetamines that are being manufactured? The major source is Mexico, similar to what we saw with cocaine in Colombia. John Mackey was able to convince congressional leadership and both the Clinton and Bush administrations that we need to start investing a billion dollars a year to strengthen the Colombian police, the Colombian military, to spray crops down there. And I believe we had an incredible success in Colombia. I was married down there. Our wedding ceremony was in Colombia in 2005. And people said, you wouldn't have wanted to been down here in 2000. Bogota was wild then. Things have settled down so much. They said it couldn't be done. There was too much corruption in Colombia. The FARC were a terrorist group that were taking hostages. It couldn't be done. We achieved tremendous successes there. We need to look at the same thing for Mexico right now. The heroin that's being grown, so much of it is coming from Mexico. The drugs that are being manufactured, some are being manufactured in China, smuggled to Mexico, and then brought in. So I actually think the president, when he declared the national emergency on the border, it should have been focused more on opioids, not that illegal immigration is not a huge issue. We should have focused on that. It could have brought everyone together. We need what I'm calling a plan America instead of a plan Colombia, a plan Mexico. Let's call it plan America, and let's do an all-out approach. And if Mexico won't cooperate with us, we need to make our relations contingent on that. 70,000 Americans dying of drug overdoses is just unbelievable. So that's what, that's what I want to do in Congress is try to, to take this model from Plan Colombia and see if we can fight demand. And I think um, as we do that, drugs come in, they're less pure, there's less supply. People are still making poor choices. We still need the counseling. We still need the compassion locally. But I think this is the great contribution of the federal government if we could, we could stop the supply lines. What's your long-term aspirations? So my dad is 82 years old. He's a deacon at Holy Family Church. He's a retired IBMer, and he taught after he retired for IBM for 20 years. I love teaching. If you said, what are you going to be doing when you're 82? I hope I'm teaching again. I hope I'm a former member of Congress who's, who's teaching. I believe deeply in... What I mentioned earlier, I call it the marriage and family ministry. We're in a situation right now where we're seeing a lot of our, our friends' parents split. So it's that, you know, your kids, hey, we've been together 10 years. It's hard raising kids. So I'd, I'd love to, after Congress, think about doing something in the marriage ministry. We're trying now. You know, whenever I run into friends who are having trouble or even ones who aren't, here's some books I have on marriage. Here's some things that, that we're working on. It's hard for us too, even though we think we have a great marriage, we can always do better. It's the hardest, yes. hardest thing. So those are definitely a couple of things that I'd like to work on. I'd like to go back into prisons at some point too. I think that's just an amazing ministry as well. But right now let's, let's see about getting to Congress and in fighting for a bold plan for America, some bold reforms. Wonderful. And at the end of the day, you're a humanitarian, right? Which is, I think the most wonderful gift uh, right. for I, anyone. I think it is, and I'll come back to that as, as people watch us and say, oh, you're talking about, we didn't talk about tax cuts that much, but Art Laffer, you know, he just, he just said when he was with us the other night, this is economics, this is math. And we like to say, sometimes there's some in the political spectrum, oh, the wealthy have too much, and we like to do this class warfare. The lower tax rates, the freedom agenda, when Americans make more choices, I think things go better and we're going to do better with that and that's certainly the mission i'm taking to congress with the humanitarian with the compassionate side i think if we could do both we could be the the ronald reagan the jack kemp and get that message across and get some solutions that are that are helping all americans we want we want the solutions that help everyone that help lift up the poor that help 
Americans reach their full potential. Wonderful. George Phillips, thanks so much. Best of luck to you in this campaign. We'll be watching closely. And again, welcome to the American Real family. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review, as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one-on-one -on -one coaching, check out the American Real Learning Academy, where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we could help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. And speaking of podcasting, our next course will be starting soon. So if you're interested in launching your own podcast, join me and podcast your passion. I'll take you through my eight-week course where I'll mentor you to build a world-class podcast. I'm only taking on a small group of people who want to share their passion through broadcasting, where I'll have you up on iTunes and YouTube within weeks so you can podcast your passion. Click on the link below for more information. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.